Hi, my name is Shari Wiseman, and I'm here today with Azia Rolls. Um, Azia is from the Technion Institute in um, Israel. And Azia, to start today, can you tell us a little bit about um, sort of the concept of interoception and how you study it in your lab? So interoception, the way I see it is just how, how you know how you feel. Mm. It's, it's this brain representation of uh, your internal feelings integrated with your emotional state and this knowledge of yourself, of who you are, how you are, uh, what is your state, is basically this interoception. Mm -hmm. But we are approaching that from the perspective of the immune system. Mm -hmm. Kind of the, with the idea that there is also immunoception, mm. that the brain will also form a representation of the state of the immune system because it's critical to know what is the state of the immune system for the brain to evaluate the overall state of the body. Mm. And uh, what we're starting to see is that the brain constantly forms this representation of the state of the immune system. But it's not that it's just there and, uh, and stays there. Mm -hmm. It can also be used by the brain to guide and to regulate their physiology in general and the immune system. And in some cases, it can even kind of uh, recreate these immunological states. Mm. Can you tell us more about that? So we know that there are some reoccurring disease that uh, or we call them like this, uh, like in I Crohn's when patients have this relapse in remit. Mm -hmm. And often they will say that there was like an emotional trigger that initiated the relapse. Mm. And it's not that we really understand how it happens, but one of the assumptions, and this is part of our work, contributes to this concept is that potentially the brain, like every other experience that it stores a memory, it stores the same kind of representation in, in the relevant form, and it can then replay and recreate the same immunological state. Namely, you can, by different triggers, you can kind of almost, uh, it's almost like PTSD of the body. The body will recreate the disease because it's replaying the original mm -hmm. memory or the original experience. I see. So how, how have you been able to study that in your lab? So we are using transgenic mice that allow us to capture, kind of capture neurons that were active at a given time point. Mm -hmm. And we are capturing this during different diseases. And then the, we, during uh, using these genetic manipulations that allow us then to control the activity of these neurons, practically at will, uh, remote control, mm -hmm. we can uh, with dreads. It's a method that allows to reactivate these neurons. So then, after mice recover completely from the original disease, we can reactivate these neurons, and then we can see that it actually recreates the the same immunological disease that was in the original state. Mm -hmm. And then there's the question: what what can we do about it? Yeah. <laughs> so one of I think one of the implications of that if that if we understand that indeed the brain has a role in re replaying or re recreating these episodes, relapsing episodes, then potentially we will be able to inhibit this activity. Mm -hmm. If this is the trigger, then potentially we can inhibit this activity and hopefully by kind of using this aspect of the brain also to attenuate or even prevent the reoccurring mm. conditions. So um, I think your talk was one of the only ones at this conference that mentioned the cortex. You know, we heard a <laughs> lot about subcortical circuits, brain stem circuits, um, the peripheral nervous system. How do you see um, this role of the cortex in all of this kind of brain body communication? I think we intuitively understand that the brain should have a role, and we now have a lot of evidence, and many of them are presented here, mm. that the brain kind of records, the st uh, it monitors the state of the immune system, and then it can initiate a corrective response. And this, is, this can happen really in the subcortical level. But we also know that uh, there is something more that the brain can offer, like uh, motivations, and mm, I mentioned that this, my, uh, this in my talk, but. Uh, when we get, like when we have a deadline for a grant, we don't get sick because you just can't get sick. Mm -hmm. So somehow with your motivation and what your needs and this higher brain function kind of regulate and guide your physiology, you can hold on to some kind of physiological state because of uh, the, so it will align with your motivations and others. 
So this is one example. Another example will be uh, hope. Mm. Mm. Uh, that uh, when we are talking about uh, patients like uh, placebo, <laughs> which is a yeah. great example of that. Yeah. So there you have this um, the positive expectation of the patient. It comes from many different aspects, including the cortex, including the reward system. And what we see is that we, if we activate the same brain areas, we actually can, the, area, the reward system, which is related to these positive expectations, we can actually boost immunity. Mm. And, this, and this goes in uh, the different uh, aspects of um, how motivation can eventually also translate into changes in immunity and in physiology. Oh, very interesting. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the work that you've done on activating the reward system and different disease models? So what we see, and it comes from these uh, observations in psychology and e epidemiology, that there are different personality traits, like uh, optimism and uh, having sense of purpose in life. And, and they seem to be correlated with improve some kind of health outcome, including uh, in uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, recovery from uh, cardiovascular disease. And what we were thinking that in, maybe then this, and all these aspects of personal like optimism and uh, this sense of purpose mm -hmm. are related to activity of the reward system. So this is how we, we came to this idea that maybe we can actually, by activating the reward system, we can then treat all these conditions. So in the past, we showed it in the context of antibacterial immunity. Mm -hmm. We showed it in the context of uh, anti-tumor immunity. And now we were able to show it also in the context of myocardial infarction. Mm -hmm. It's all in mice. But uh, I think, uh, the, and these are models, of course, mm -hmm. so with their limitations. But what we are seeing is that actually the brain can initiate different pathways that in the end will also improve recovery also from cardiovascular uh, uh, conditions, specifically in M e MI, mm -hmm. as we show it. Oh, very interesting. Um, what, as you've been doing this research, what are some of the things that have, have kind of surprised you? I mean, I think a lot of people, when they read your papers, are really su sort of surprised and impressed by some of the phenomena that you've been able to describe. Is there anything that, that you found really surprising in the field? Everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, uh, I think I'm always amazed. Uh, one thing is that I can never predict the outcome. This mm -hmm. is pretty amazing. Like, we can always, we, we formulate our hypothesis, and then the results are always surprising and retrospectively make sense. Ah, yeah. So it's, it's this amazing, and I think the, the impact of the system and the fact, the pathways the brain will choose. So er, for example, we saw that every time we activate the reward system in different physiological conditions, like bacterial infection or cancer on MI, but the brain seem to choose different pathway to use, uh, like uh, once it will activate the neurons in the bone marrow, once in the spleen, yeah. once in the liver. So the fact that the brain has this specificity I did not expect that. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I did not expect the strong effects that we see. Like it, when we had the cancer results, uh, so what we saw is that we are activating the reward system and we could see actually improvement in the si tumor size up to 50%. Up to 50%. Wow. And it was crazy when we saw it. And I think we repeated this experiment so many times. And every time we saw the phenomenon, it was like, oh, it works. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the. The strength of the effect is amazing. And I, I think we're not even reaching the point because we are looking from a specific lens. So we are looking on the immune system and we see these effects on the immune system and they're significant. And of course, the immune system is critical, for example, in cancer. Mm -hmm. But the outcome, the physiological outcome in the end, I think it's a combination of many more factors that we are still missing. Mm. I think the brain initiates multiple pathways that synchronize together, and we are not there. I see. Interesting. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, how your work involves the cortex and how that, that maybe makes you able to study some more um, complex sort of cognitive aspects of, of controlling the immune response um, in mice. But I was wondering if maybe you could talk about some of the work that you've been doing in humans where you can imagine you know, this massive expansion of the <laughs> cortex and maybe much more complicated kinds of regulation or even bringing in sort of 
conscious percepts of, you know, how am I feeling and how does this relate to other experiences I've had and things like that. So there is a really interesting uh, body of work uh, actually in the psychology field, mm -hmm. especially works of Alia Krum. So she's been showing how changing state of mind about the physiological state can actually change your physiology. Mm. And uh, we're learning a lot from these concepts. And what we were doing, and it was in collaboration with Talma Handler and her group, so we were trying to use fMRI guided neurofeedback to train individual to change uh, the activity in the mesolimbic system. And we are doing that, uh, and the fact is that we have an fMRI trace allows us to really monitor the activity. And then we are looking on what is the outcome in terms of the immune response. And it was amazing to see that it is relevant to humans. I think the biggest gap for us in the beginning was, OK, so we are working on mice. It, it's a very really conserved network, but we don't know if it's also conserved in terms of the um, immune effect. So we right. know it conserved yeah. behaviorally in many ways, but maybe it's not relevant for the immune system and for the other pathways. But the fact that we saw some uh, kind of somewhat similar effects also in humans, I think it, it kind of gives hope that maybe it's relevant also for humans and will have and will potentially will have some translational mm. uh, implications. Oh, very interesting. So, um, what what are the sort of next directions for your research? What are the the new horizons that you're excited about? So many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Basically, I'm trying to conserve right. and train <laughs> myself all the time, and this yeah. is the biggest challenge. Uh, but I think it's now it's really understanding what what are the how is it happening? How the brain creates this specificity? How eventually the brain knows where to go when we create the response? Uh, what can trigger this brain kind of representations? Mm. Um, there has to be some kind of trigger for that. And uh, what is the natural kind of trigger? Uh, actually, we know some examples for that because even from the 1800s, we know there was a clinician describing a patient of his. Uh, so she was allergic to pollen. Mm. And even when presented her with an artificial flower, she responded with allergy. Oh. So, and there, clinicians can describe many examples for that, like that. So what we are trying to understand, what will be the equivalent? So how in the brain, this kind of cues when the, will then trigger this immu immune representation in the brain. So I think now we're in the stage of, uh, we describe some phenomena and we're trying to get deeper to understanding how, what are the mechanisms eventually, how does it happen and how, how the brain creates all this specificity. Oh, very cool. And in terms of translating this into human patients, what do you think some of the most tractable directions might be? I think there is a wide range of potential implications. First, uh, once we understand which brain areas, then potentially we have this, uh, we will have like uh, the capacity to, to regulate which areas we want. And then there is a field that is emerging of uh, um, non-invasive mani mm. brain manipulations. Mm -hmm. And they range all the way from uh, virtual reality uh, to guided fMRI guided neurofeedback, to TMS, uh, focus ultrasound. So mm -hmm. there are many ways in which you can do these manipulations. And then I think in extreme cases, one, one of the things we're thinking, for example, in patients with uh, severe uh, Crohn's, which right. really suffer and there is no other method. So potentially even brain implants can be relevant for this kind of patients to inhibit the activities of areas that are responsible for uh, kind of propagating or the relapses of the disease. So I think there is a range of implications. We are still really in the very yeah. animal. I mean, that is fascinating. The idea that maybe you would have a brain implant to treat a gut, what we think of as a gut <laughs> disease, you know? but. I, to me, one of the things that's uh, come out, been really highlighted for me from this meeting is that um, it's all neuroscience. <laughs> you know, the whole body <laughs> is neuroscience. I think what this meeting has been doing is actually really good in connecting and showing how 
we cannot really isolate and how everything that happens in the body has a manifestation in the brain. And why I think once it's also vice versa. And we see that how changes in the brain, whichever, where, wherever they come from, whether from motivation or from other reasons, or m like behavioral state or a productive state, and how they eventually affect everything and all our physiology. I think it's exciting time because we're going to start to connect the two and they were divided for too long. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, very great. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you for talking to me. <laughs>